today we are thrilled to have with us Matt Pohl. Matt will reflect on his experiences in a range of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander projects he's been involved in within the Australian and international arts organisations for over the past 20 years. A recent graduate of the Indigenous Arts Leadership Program, supported by West Farmers Arts, Matt has been appointed as the Manager of Indigenous Programs at the Australian National Maritime Museum in Eora Gadigal, Sydney. Previously, Matt has worked as the Repatriation repatri Project Officer at the University of Sydney, as well as the Assistant Curator of Indigenous Heritage Collections at the Chow Chuck Wing Museum, University of Sydney, and recent curatorial works include exhibitions of Welcome to Jungle Foundations and Ambassadors. Matt is the chairperson of Oriana Arts, Midwestern Regional New South Wales, and a member of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Advisory Board for Sydney Museum of Contemporary Art, MCA, and a member of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Collection Management Resource Group at the Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences, Powerhouse. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you all to Matt. Matt, thank you for being here today, brother. We really appreciate it. Um, and congratulations on your recent appointment. Hi, Ian. Thanks so much for inviting me today. And thank you so much for that really wonderful introduction. <laughs> My pleasure. I hand it over to you and we'll, I'll see you at the Q&A uh, sec part at the end of today's presentation. <laughs> Thanks, no Matt. Thank you. So thank you everybody for joining in today. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging where I'm speaking from today, which is the lands of the Wangal people in Western Sydney along the Parramatta River. <clears throat> An acknowledgement of country is a political act recognizing the sovereignty of Australia's first peoples. And it's a crucial aspect of all public events that we do these days. The Wangal were just one among many numerous communities spread across the Greater Sydney Basin. They were connected through to the Darkinyung in the Central Coast, the Gandangara of the Blue Mountains and the Darawal of Illawarra. When we acknowledge Wangal land, we also acknowledge the many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations across Australia. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations and their cultural knowledges, which were appropriated and transformed into the wealth of the Australian nation which in turn has built all the institutions of government and society, which we take for granted today. <clears throat> so just briefly to give you a little bit of background of myself, I've um, been incredibly fortunate to work in the arts for a number of years now. My family connections and my indigenous ancestry is through the Wadigo family of the Byron Bay region up on the North coast of New South Wales. This is some pictures of my family in the 1930s, actually, who were, and you can actually see what is now, what it goes beach in the background there, quite a special part of the country to many people today. You can actually see another photo down in the corner there of the what it goes farmhouse where they all lived. Um, these were incredibly proud South Sea Islander, Torres Strait Islander women, and I just pay so much respect to the guidance and the strength and the resilience that these women uh, taught to me when I was younger. Unfortunately, my grandmother passed away when I was quite young and I lost a lot of connection to learning so much. But in the short time that I did know her, she was just incredibly powerful in the way that she shaped so much of the way that I see the world today. Um, so it was a very open brief today to talk about this presentation and working on the West Farmers Indigenous Arts Program in Wagga Wagga back in June was an, a really important opportunity for me to actually reflect on my career a little bit. Um, I've been mostly based in Sydney. I grew up on the mainland, um, but also it's what keeps coming back to me throughout so many times throughout my career is these chance meetings and the personal networks that we build ourselves as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders working in the arts community where we sort of do a lot of the on the job training ourselves and we build these incredible networks. Um, so many times people that I've just sort of met later down the track, just the significance of those meetings have resonated back with me. And 
In the top corner here, we have Uncle James Ingram, who welcomed us onto country as part of the West Farmers Indigenous Arts Leadership Program in June. Um, if we had have known, it was part of the, it was the last week before we had this massive lockdown in Sydney. Um, it was actually, I think, what's, what's carried me through the last couple of months, being able to be so grounded and situated in a very strong, staunch community situation, you know, while learning, while networking and while sharing. And I'd like to really acknowledge the West Farmers Indigenous Arts Leadership Program for um, giving me that chance to actually personally reflect on my own experiences and to explore a little bit more of some of the connections and the amazing people I've met over the years who have helped me throughout my journey. I actually began my career in, at Wollongong City Gallery back in 1998. Um, you know, there's something really positive to be said about NAIDOC Week and especially on the east coast of Australia. You know, we're very familiar with the, the powerhouses of the Aboriginal art industry since the 1970s, like Papunya Tula or the, um, the art centres that are based in Arnhem Land and different parts of the country like that. But with that big juggernaut, juggernaut of Aboriginal art that was taking off, there was these amazing opportunities for the 300 nations right across the country to develop their own story to look inward and actually work with their local communities to actually ask the question, what is this experience of the local Aboriginal landscape? And to, uh, so in 1998, working on a NAIDOC Week exhibition was one of the most um, daunting yet most incredible experiences that I think set me up in that one exhibition for so many other experiences about listening to community, letting community tell their story and um, seeing the incredible beauty in the artistic landscape which exists. Which exists. Uh, two people, the one on the right of your screen is Uncle Kevin Butler, who was an amazing influence on myself. When I first met him, he was he just recently completed the art that was on the cover of the Stolen Generations Bringing Them Home report. Um, you know, he was making these amazing paintings and it just felt so incredible to be able to sort of stand in the presence of an artist who was making such a national impact from just much, such a small regional art centre on the east coast of Australia. Uh, Cheryl Davison on the left there was another one whose beautiful work is actually in the National Gallery. I think both Kevin and Cheryl are in the National Gallery. But um, it really just pushed me towards seeing uh, the Aboriginal landscape through Aboriginal eyes and overturning this, you know, predominant idea of the Australian landscape tradition as it was, as it was taught to me when I was at school anyway. Um, you know, I went to high school in the late 80s and Aboriginal art certainly wasn't on the curriculum in the school that I went to in any case. So um, it was part of a program called by run by a place called Enter Arts Media, where several of us actually were placed in different um, arts institutions across Sydney, uh, Wollongong and the Central Coast. And I've still most of those people that I've met through that program are still working in the arts today. You know, there's such strength to be shown from these programs to actually give young, emerging and other people in the community the chance to actually enter these intimidating spaces of art galleries and museums and different sort of arts cultural industries like that. It just takes a little push sometimes and the, the flow on effects for tourism, for the local economy, for uh, reconciliation and truth telling, most importantly, uh, just been astounding to me to actually see play out over a number of years. But I always look back to those first experiences just working in a regional art gallery and I encourage anybody else who's at the start of their careers to actually explore the regional spaces that are out there as places where you can actually get your foot in the door a little bit better and you know develop your ideas, understand a little bit how the bigger institutions might work and take the, your place from there. Um, after that, I worked at like the Museum of Contemporary Art just in visitor services and I did some public art facilitation at Fairfield and Holroyd councils out in Western Sydney. But I guess in 2005, one of my formal and foremost educational experiences was being appointed the artistic director of the Bamali Aboriginal Artists Cooperative, which was then based in Leichhardt in Sydney. Um, 
the impact that the founding members of the Mali Aboriginal Artists Cooperative had had on the Australian cultural landscape is still being measured. Um, there's been some in-house amazing little survey exhibitions of the 20, the 25th, the 30th anniversary of the Mali, but nothing really on the national scale that has actually explored just the deep impact. It's not just through paintings and sculptures and installation and film that these founding members have left their mark on the Australian art scene. It stretches out into publications, you know, doing book covers, um, you know, doing theatrical backdrops for Bangara for different sort of organisations. I'll get into this a little bit more, but the, the cultural renaissance, which was initiated from Sydney and in particular Redfern from the 1980s, is one of those moments in recent Australian history where you can actually see the zeitgeist changing, you know, and people who have largely taught themselves. I mean, several of the Bumali members did go to tertiary art schools, but several of them didn't as well. And a lot of the artists that I worked with at Bumali never even finished high school, let alone went to um, formal tertiary arts education at universities and things like that. And it really shows you how there was this community authored grassroots from the ground up um, renaissance, there's no other word to really describe it, that, um, that the, especially the founding members of Bumali, you know, encapsulated. So just briefly, Bumali is today still a powerhouse and it's, it's basic premise, although this has changed over different times for different focuses. It's for New South Wales based Aboriginal artists who are sort of operating outside that commercial scene. And it's a place where people can, you know, connect together, um, find other community members to get critical feedback about the type of art that they're making and foremost just actually express themselves to tell their own story on their own terms. Um, every sort of state has their own sort of like um, this art space which is operated in the same way. But in 1987, when Bumali was formed, it was a, a radical political act in so many ways and um, I was incredibly fortunate when I started there that the chairperson, uh, Mr. Jeffrey Samuels, actually took me under my wing a little bit. And, you know, as a founding member of Bumali um, and as an um, artist who has been participated in every sort of space where he could find the time to fit it into his schedule, um, Jeffrey's been a mentor and a huge personal inspiration to me. Um, not to mention just an incredible artist. His work is in several major collections. Um, you know, he was still producing work for this year's um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Mardi Gras exhibition, which was held at Bumali. I think he's participated in every one of those shows since 2006 and early, and in the earlier versions of that show, which were curated by artists such as Brooke Andrew and Rhea. Um, so it's to be in the presence of people who've lived and breathed and actually stood there at some of those foundational turning points in Australian art history was possibly more than I could have ever learned through um, reading books or, you know, going to um, universities and other sort of places like that. Um, and it's amazing to see Jeff still producing work today. But that cultural renaissance is really fascinating. If you look on the left hand here, this is a place called The Settlement. And it's another space from the 1980s, which was sort of like an after school uh, care center, um, homework center. It was a drop in place for community members who just wanted to catch up for a cup of tea or different things like that. And prior to Bumali, this was the type of space where Aboriginal art in the Sydney region was, it was the crucible of where it was all forming in the big, commercial galleries across Sydney at the time, you have these big bark painting exhibitions and, you know, Papunya Tula paintings, which are selling for extraordinary amounts of money. But in the Redfern community, it's places like the Settlement and the Eora College of Arts, which are developing and nurturing the careers of some of our most incredible artists today. If you see where the arrow is pointing from the picture here, um, this is the 1985 exhibition or 86, I think, exhibition, which shows some of Tracy Moffat's photography just on the um, 
you know, the, the cheap pin board, notice board sort of exhibition space. I mean, there's actually something quite beautiful in that as well. Um, but, you know, this work is actually Tracy Moffat's um, portrait of David Gulpalil on Bondi Beach is in permanent collections around the world. It's in the Museum of Modern Art. It's in the Art Gallery of New South Wales. It's in numerous sorts of spaces, but it's really important to sort of bring it back to where all that began and the, the incredible sense of ownership of the story of Aboriginal art and culture as artists at that time made their own paths and made their own pathways. It was um, the impetus for the creation of the Bamali Aboriginal Arts Cooperative, as well as the Bengara Dance Theatre. Um, Gadigal Koori Radio was like a, a broadcast network connecting all these organisations at the time. You have uh, film organisations, you have literature, you have all these great organisations with the most humble of beginnings, which have actually grown to take the world by storm in so many different ways. Um, <clears throat> another great artist that I actually got to spend a lot of time personally with while I was working at Bamali between 2005 and 2009 was uh, Harry J. Wedge. Um, it's hard to put his story in perspective. Um, he was an artist who you know, suffered a disability at a young age, which sort of, he was a really bad hip injury. He um, had a terrible time at school. He'd been um, in and out of um, detention centres when he was much younger. Um, completely self-taught artist. Um, didn't mix his paints properly. He didn't do anything like that. Yet the expressive nature of the work that he created and this first person account of what it was like, you know, living on the mission at Urambi in Kara was just an incredible powerful document of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, um, I guess the protest movement in the 1980s as well. I mean, he wouldn't even do sketches before he started these. He would just paint straight with his brush dipped into the large acrylic bottles of paint, um, you know, and quite prolific. You know, his resume was probably around 15 pages long. It was an artistic exhibition resume that a lot of non-Indigenous artists of that era who were um, professionals in the industry would um, die to have that sort of level of recognition of his work being housed in international collections. But, you know, when I met him, he was still living on the mission at Urambi. You know, he was um, always doing it pretty tough in terms of, you know, not wanting to sell painting sometimes because it would impact his Centrelink um, payments. It's horrifying to think how still, even in the mid 2000s, um, Aboriginal artists from New South Wales had still had to sort of fight for a little bit of recognition and for that little bit of justice towards being treated as, you know, some what are today seen as some of the greatest contemporary artists of that era. Um, there were so many international um, connections which started around that era as well. This is a photo of the Chippendale Bart Bamali Gallery, I believe, um, with an international conversation taking place between artists Ria, uh, Harry J. Wedge, and the American Indian artist Edgar Heaper Birds. Um, some of these conversations sparked exhibitions in places like Washington and the United States. Um, and they also were showing the power of Aboriginal art as a communication tool, not just speaking amongst Aboriginal nations for the first time in a number of years within Australia, but First Nations to First Nations, conversations that was happening between First Nations people around the world. Um, this is also in the lead up to the, the year of the United Nations Year of um, Indigenous Peoples. Um, so many of these small scale conversations actually turned into um, policies, protocols, um, statements that have shaped the political landscape in Australia and around the world as well. Um, and, you know, to be able to just work amongst these artists and see, um, and, you know, the most humble sort of people that you would meet also having these incredible um, stories of the work that they had achieved in their lifetime is probably why I say that the experience of Bamali was more formative than anything else that I could have learned in other sort of educational spaces, for example.
Um, sadly, another artist who passed away earlier this year is Uncle Roy Kennedy, who is another um, amazing artist who I was incredibly fortunate to meet and work with. Um, his memories of growing up on the Warren Geesda mission out in Western New South Wales were another example of a person who he didn't even really start making his etchings until he was in his late 60s, early 70s, um, and then produced an incredibly powerful series of etchings, a couple of hundred of etchings and a few paintings as well, um, that show something that was left out of the history books. Most of our archival information about missions and reserves in New South Wales comes down to the, the records that were kept by the mission managers and the, um, the priests who you know, visited and a few doc photographic documentary records, but they don't tell you the story as it was known amongst community members themselves. And this is the living memory that especially us younger people today know from working with our elders is the living memory of what it was like to grow up during the assimilation era in Australia between 1930 and 1970. Um, and just the fact that there was so few records from Aboriginal people themselves, um, you know, mapping out where people lived on the mission, you know, what different parts of the mission were used for. You know, there's a lot of sadness, there's a lot of um, disappointment and some, you know, some gut-wrenchingly terrifying stories that people tell as well. And they're also intermixed every now and then with these beautiful little stories of community coming together, of people collaborating, you know, learning from each other, um, helping out each other, just, you know, going fishing together, different sort of things like that, that show despite, you know, the incredibly harsh uh, situation which was imposed on them, they were still resi resilient and they still built a community themselves, despite being stopped at every step of the way. Um, so working at Bumali and being with artists such as that was such um, an incredible experience. Um, you know, to just go back to the international impact, this is a photo from the Chippendale Gallery, I think, as well, that shows the members of U2, the rock band U2, um, visiting the gallery, you know, just to meet the artists. I think um, Gadigal Radio and Bumali Gallery were the first stop for a lot of those international performers in the 80s and 90s as well. It's hilarious when you talk to community members and you hear stories of the people that they've met, you know, and just how um, important those spaces were as counter narratives and alternative spaces that told a version of Australia's history that wasn't known and it certainly wasn't promoted by the governments of the time. Um, and so that was, this is, Bumali was also formed in, right in the lead up to the 1988 bicentenary, those massive protest movements which came from every corner of the country and galvanized themselves here in Sydney. Um, it's taking several decades later, but as different documentary filmmakers and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander historians and authors and artists as well, are repositioning this moment in history as a, as for the incredible space that it was. Um, so I finished up at Bumali around 2009 and um, I was incredibly fortunate to uh, find an opportunity at what was the Maclay Museum. The Maclay Museum is based on the grounds of the University of Sydney. It's a natural history museum. There was at the time several museums on campus. There was the Nicholson for Classical Antiquities and the small art gallery, which was the university art collection as well. But the Nicholson, I mean, the Maclay Museum was a fantastic space. It, um, it had a very problematic collection. I'll get onto that after this section when I talk about the repatriation project I worked on. But it was built, this museum space was built around 1891. It, the actual building itself was built in response to the Garden Palace fire. If you've ever seen that amazing work that Jonathan Jones did for the Caldor projects in the Royal Botanic Gardens a few years ago, where basically several thousand of Aboriginal objects from East Coast Australia were destroyed in a massive fire. Um, the, a huge loss of tangible evidence of Sydney's Aboriginal past was actually destroyed in that fire. This uh, museum space was built to the highest standards of fireproofing at the time. Um, and it was 
a really interesting collection. So there's a, to not go into too much detail, but the intersection between the pre-Federation colonial Australia and natural history and places like the Linnaean societies of New South Wales were actually places where a lot of Aboriginal knowledges were recorded. Um, there's not a lot of Aboriginal ownership over the production of that knowledge that's taking place at the time. But um, through working at the Maclay Museum for around nine years or so, I think I was able to really bring that sense of community ownership of knowledge, which I had learned through Bumali towards a very different um, collection. Um, museums and galleries these days aren't that different in some ways, although they do have different agendas and different purposes. But when you're talking with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultural materials, um, those distinctions which museums or galleries use to classify them in different ways really break down. Um, you know, artists sometimes come to museums to look for um, knowledges about manufacturing techniques, about um, they can look at decorative patterns and motifs and different things like that and explore the use of them in contemporary contexts with appropriate ethical authorization from other community members. Um, although the ways that a lot of these Aboriginal artifacts and objects were acquired can be incredibly problematic. Um, these days, I think what we what I tried to do when I was at um, the Maclay Museum was to let community members themselves guide what happens to these objects and what they how they actually exist in terms of future community use of those historical items. Um, so there's just a couple of shots. One of the amazing things we had was uh, Rodney Kelly visit the museum. He produced, he was just at the start of his campaign to for the repatriation of the Gwigal Shield from the British Museum at this time. The exhibition on the left there is one called Outlines, which I was incredibly proud of. It was a bunch of New South Wales sourced objects that um, we were at the time very, we would we were just renaming them through consultation with community members in the language groups of the Sydney region so that we could try and do this some um, language revitalization in the cultural of the of those knowledges which exist in Sydney. Um, and so you can see the impact of natural history museums really importantly in the work of artists like Danny Mellor. Um, some of his large scale drawings where he has actually situated um, sometimes objects and replaced uh, and placed uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men and women back into the landscape of these um, um, of recontextualized where these objects do situate, you know, taking them out of a, a, a dusty museum shelf and actually repurposing them back into the landscapes. Uh, Danny Miller was a lecturer at Sydney College of the Arts at the time, and it was fantastic when um, Aboriginal scholars and teachers would actually use the museum's collections and exhibitions as a teaching tool in that form, not to actually teach them about museums, but to actually help uh, people at the start of their career critically engage with what these objects mean and how to represent them. You know, we don't just display them as a random curatorial choice, wherever you can make that a purposeful decision to place something, um, you know, the right way around um, or to not, or to choose to not to show something is something that takes a lot of conversation and something that is an important way that contemporary curating practices um, have sort of developed and something I was able to see firsthand working at places like the Maclay. The other big project I did when I was at Maclay was working with their stone tool collection. Um, you know, it was a very, I mean, I'm certainly not an archaeologist. I, um, I wanted to approach these several thousand stone tools we had as if they were, you know, fragments of Aboriginal land. Um, you know, there's sculptural properties, there's knowledges that are embedded in stone tools that sort of tell you how they're made and how people um, used them over many generations. And, you know, they can show, they can show us trade networks which existed thousands of years ago, for example. 
And, you know, as sometimes they're actually quite beautiful objects in themselves. And I think that was where we also developed this sort of idea of not using archaeological terminologies and names for these objects, but grouping hundreds of stone tools by a language region to actually look at it as a bit of a toolbox, as a toolkit for sort of understanding the, the, the breadth of ingenuity that um, um, is in some ways the only tangible evidence we have of such of the deep occupation of every corner of the Australian continent. This is just a couple more shots of the exhibition showing um, the, the one of the intersections with um, you know stone tool manufacture and rock painting, for example, um, which you know ochre is a ground up form of a soft rock. Um, you know when you turn that when you think of pigment. Um, in terms of its um, geological properties, it's just an expansion of the stone tool repertoire that people have been practicing for tens of thousands of years. Um, not to mention just can be individually just quite beautiful objects in themselves. So that was actually one exhibition and publication that I was incredibly proud of and something where I was able to sort of insert that community authored, um, almost a protest against the way that these objects existed in museum collections and re-exhibit them in ways that the first layer of people who would understand or interpret them was the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community, you know, and then putting other audiences who want to see these items as heritage artifacts or as, you know, different sorts of science, scientific knowledges, for example, Sort of putting them to the side for the first time and actually allowing um, the objects to actually speak for themselves. And this led into some uh, incredible other projects which I've been fortunate to work uh, with through organisations like Arana Arts out in Dubbo in central New South Wales. There was a big uh, ARC project a couple of years ago um, led by Robin McKenzie at ANU, um, the Relational Museum. And it was looking at this idea of just the tens, if not hundreds of thousands of stone tool artifacts, which had been dug up by farmers throughout the late 19th and 20th centuries. And how many of these are actually just sitting in milk crates and boxes um, completely. Um, I mean, they are evidence of people removing people's native title rights in some ways. When you look at a piece of land these days and you, they say that there's, oh, there's no evidence of Aboriginal occupation. Well, sometimes it's because all that evidence has actually been swept up and put in a box and sent down to a capital city somewhere. Um, it's a massive job in terms of rectifying this unethical practice of acquiring stone tool artifacts. One thing, when I worked on that exhibition, I was getting literally just random stone tools posted to me from right around the country. It was horrifying. Um, and, you know, it led into other ideas where we sort of connected where people were trying to do that with repatriation projects as they different existed in different museums and things like that at the time too. Um, but today they still see it as this um, problem waiting to be fixed when they shouldn't be because there's beautiful knowledges about where people you can see on some of these photos here there's tags I mean some of the people who collected them did actually take notes of where they found them um, you know sometimes you could do um, residue testing on these things to see starch residues from the type of plants that people were using them to to harvest or you know where they were located can tell you different environmental knowledges as well of the past before the massive land clearing that took place. So to start with objects and to build that community layer of interpretation into them, which is actually just a simple act of privileging the elders and the community representatives who have the first right of response into terms of interpreting those objects is something that's an ongoing job for many of us if we want to ch to challenge that not you there's no need to exhibit all these things a lot of these things are incredibly repetitive in terms of you know once you've seen 10 grindstones do you really need to see another 50 but um where they have been appropriately engaged with by community elders there's some fascinating opportunities to lift up all our regional art centres and um, museums and historical societies across local towns all across the country. Um, 
I think I'm, I might just have to go a bit faster there. So yeah, um, and it sort of intersected with what I worked with with the university's repatriation project. I mean, I worked largely repatriating around 40 sets of old peoples to around 22 Aboriginal land councils across New South Wales throughout that time. Um, you know, the diversity of burial practices that are, um, exist across Australia and the diversity of mortuary practices which was completely overwritten by the pastoral expansion of Australia is another huge area where we just don't have enough people on the ground working to actually rectify some of those mistakes of the past. Um, and where museums have acquired ancestral remains, um, there's just no question about the need for those to be returned to communities and reinterred in the lands where they were found. Um, ethically and appropriately and respectfully, which is most important. Um, the history of how people's remains were used by museums is incredibly hurtful and it's not something to go into here, other than to say that the templates which Australian museums have listened to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community members about are slowly being picked up and replicated in museums around the world. This respect for the dignity of Aboriginal people's wishes in how their remains are actually reinterred is something that I think a lot of museums can't hide from anymore. You know, you can't hide that oh, I don't know where the provenance of this thing is from, so I don't have to do anything about it. That sort of way of thinking is actually disappearing, thankfully. And it was only due to the work of a lot of uh, community activist based elders groups who insisted on the return of these remains at their own personal and expense in some cases. Um, so the way that museums and museum collections has been transformed by artists who have been engaging with museum collections and bringing a sense of justice to the way that these collections have been used is an important aspect of how um, of where that distinction between museums and galleries doesn't always exist. I, um, through repatriation, I was uh, fortunate enough to attend a museum in Helsinki with Lofty Katakarinja and Sean Angeles here and uh, Christina Tomo um, in Helsinki at the uh, Helena Ratuva uh, Museum who initiated this project was an incredibly um, important experience for an international museum to actually, for the first time, learn how um, museum objects aren't just dormant collections that were collected 100 years ago and never exhibited. When uh, working with these international curators, they were incredibly emotional to see the way that Sean and Lofty you know, responded to these objects, speaking to them as if they were ancestors, looking at them and Low, you know, there was very simple information about where these objects were from, like literally just Hermansburg stamped on them. But, you know, for Lofty to sort of see and well, no, this is north of here and this is southeast of there and this is made by this type of person for this job, um, you know, just adding an incredible layer and hopefully starting a conversation about the return of some of these collections from museums that were held all around the world is where we can see some the impact of the incredible work that we do as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander curators um, and through working through networks like the, um, the West Farmers Program. Um, I think we're running low on time, Eon, so I must do another five minutes and one- Take your time, Matt. Up. The information really? you're sharing is so rich. Black oh, okay. time. Okay, I'll cut a little bit over. No, Just no, it's marvellous. Keep sharing. Um, so in 2020, I was incredibly lucky to work with the, the Westfield Hospital redevelopment. Um, one of the artists we worked with was Danny Mellor. So you can sort of see the circular thing coming back where, you know, you meet artists like you do in the programs through the Indigenous Arts Leadership Program. And then down the track, you're sort of working with them in completely different contexts. It was amazing to be able to just um, help facilitate artists like Danny to do this 60 meter photographic mural and commission it into the entrance space at the new Westmead Hospital. Um, you know, actually being out there on the river with him while he was taking photos, which he was, you know, reinterpreting into this um, massive design. Um, another fantastic artist that we worked on with this project. So essentially the gathering space at Westmead Hospital was 
one of the first opportunities for a major hospital redevelopment to build cultural safety into the, the spaces where Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander members who were using those hospital facilities would um, meet. You know, sometimes they're very joyous occasions, like a, the birth of a young child. Sometimes it's quite um, personal, sad situations, you know, with someone at the end of their life. But, you know, when we heard stories about people who were doing smoking ceremonies out in the car park, um, it was all that the hospital really needed to hear to actually build a dedicated space where community could gather, where there were artworks that referenced the local history. Westmead Hospital is right on the Parramatta River, for example. So one of the key sort of artwork themes that came out through that was, um, you know, just the meeting space. Uh, it's also the border of uh, several Western Sydney language groups, for example. So it was a gathering space. Um, it was a space where people, could, where, you know, people could actually just share culture without sort of, you know, doing it on the fringes of an institution like a hospital. And I think it's had some great impact across a, several new developments that have been built as well. This is one where I worked. Um, this is the Tools of Knowledge with several other community members who had worked on archaeology heritage assessments in the Parramatta region, for example. And we found examples of these three uh, stone tools that were located not far from the Westmead site. And we scaled them up into three benches, which um, sit at the gathering space as well. Just a simple reinsertion of, you know, what are 20,000 year old um, knowledges and repurposing them into, you know, functional spaces where people can actually sit and have conversations and talk and gather together. Um, just lastly, I mean, I, I, the, I was, I, the 12 years that I worked at the University of Sydney and nine of that was with the Maclean Museum. And then I was incredibly fortunate to spend the last three years watching that museum transform into what became the Chow Chuck Wing Museum. And there was some incredible support from across the university in regards to things like the Wingaira Mura architectural strategy, where we were able to listen to different community representatives and build their perspectives and feedback into the actual architectural fabric of the new building. One of those was actually creating a smoking space, ceremonial space within the new museum as well. Um, doing smoking ceremonies when we moved collections into the space. For the first time, a lot of those collections were welcomed, not as objects, but as representations of, as representatives of different nations from across the country. So working very closely with the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, it was fascinating to be able to see a museum of the 21st century, you know, on, from the ground level up. And uh, one of my personal um, favourite aspects of that was also going back to people I'd met much earlier in my career, like Jeffrey Samuels. Um, this is a photo of him doing, he's done all these acknowledgements of country for the um, new convention and exhibition centre at Darling Harbour. But also he was a, he did a stack of drawings um, of language maps, which were used in the display in the exhibition cases to depict areas where particular assemblages of objects were from. Um, and yeah, it was like my personal highlight to be able to go back to Jeffrey and sort of, you know, recognize the incredible impact that he'd had on my career and also build that into the new ambassadors exhibition, which is in the space as well. Um, there's simple, it was a, it's an incredible, this exhibition space in the museum. Um, and there was lots of other, like the sandstone colors and different sort of things like that were sort of taken from conversations and community consultation groups. Um, through volunteering with places like Anchor, the Association of Northern and Kimberley Artists Art Centres over several years and attending places like Darwin Aboriginal Art Fair, I was incredibly fortunate to actually meet um, community representatives. This is some Larrakia community representatives, for example, and let them design the exhibition as it was um, you know, instead of me being a curator, just selecting the objects, placing them and things like that, the community helped me write a whole new layer of interpretive information. And that's like renaming a hundred objects from 25 different language groups spread across eight different exhibition spaces. 
Um, you know, the community members came up with the exhibition titles. Um, before the lockdown and things like that happened, there was some great um, opportunities to create internships for community members, um, build, draw upon their um, needs in the education program, for example, and even stock um, items from the art centres in the, in the museum shop. Um, and we were able to achieve some of those things with various degrees of success, but also there's still a long way to go in terms of how much more we can actually be doing. You know, it's, you can see it in museums reconciliation action plans. There's actually easy ways to demonstrate some of those achievements, which are spelled out in those action plans. Um, through looking at the collection that you have and identifying who are the people that are the most authorized to speak on behalf of it. I was incredibly lucky that so many art centers were just so welcoming and, you know, wanted, um, you know, when you do a consultation, you don't just randomly walk up to any member of the community, you know, you, you do, you go through the um, like welcome to country and you sometimes wait, it might be days, it might be months, but when you are invited in, you take that opportunity and you listen to the teachers and the professors and the, the authorized community members as they exist in different communities. And um, through letting them shape and guide how different exhibition spaces were built, I think we were able to create an entirely new form, not a new form, because it's based on the protocols of respect that um, elders have always been teaching me throughout my career, for example. But we were able to um, build that consultation process into the exhibition outcomes. That was the simple goal. and. Um, I think there's some great examples where you can see where that actually took place. Um, you can also see that here with the Yolnu Bark Paintings exhibition that we were able to do as one of the major launch exhibitions of the new museum as well. So on the left here, we, well, we have this amazing bark painting collection that we were working with from 1946-47. And Yalpi Unipingu and Wannabe Marika as senior community members came down and we basically, um, mapped out the exhibition on the floor with large sheets of paper. It was too much, um, they're quite um, fragile, some of these paintings, so it wasn't a matter of using the objects themselves, but for them to see the paint, the objects closely, and then to think about them, we were able to sort of transform that into the actual outline of how we displayed the exhibitions, even in terms of replicating that experience of laying them all out on the floor and mapping out the different paintings and their relationships to each other as thematic groups came from those initial discussions where we were able to um, let community guide us and author us and you know teach us you know just because it's a university doesn't mean that you can't be taught new things um, so yeah to get back to how I sort of have been working in recent years that led up to the leadership program. Um, it's through volunteering and inserting yourself at that community level, you know, volunteering at places wherever you have to, you know, instead of, you know, expecting community to give you knowledge. Um, when you sort of insert yourself into the, the social space of where community are coming from, you realise just how um, one-sided that idea of curating is and the the benefits of actually working alongside community members and letting them guide what happens is where you get far better results and far better ethical results. This is when we were visiting um, uh, Kakadu and in, uh, just outside Jabiru. You know, it's, it's an outdoor museum. It has like five... 5,000 sites of particular rock paintings. It's like a museum without walls. They described it to us. One of the most incredible art galleries in the world. And, you know, um, there was like two or three rangers at most who looked after all those 5,000 sites. I mean, imagine that within a museum and just having like two or three security guards for some of the world's most treasured artworks. Um, there's just an incredible amount of work that needs to be done in terms of resourcing at the ground level, not just our art centers and uh, community museums and keeping places, but the, the people who you know, maintain country. You know, if you wanna think of the, 
the landscape as a museum in itself, preserving all these Aboriginal knowledges. There's just so many roles that need to be played. And there's so much decision making that needs to be undertaken by community members that we've only really touched the tip of the iceberg in terms of the work that we could be doing. Um, and just lastly, to sort of show some of the work that I'm currently working with at the Australian National Maritime Museum. So, you know, so much of that work um, in relation to lands rights activism, which I learned from those community leaders from Redfern, for example, um, it was a, an eye-opening experience to me to realize how sea rights is actually an incredibly new area of um, not activism, but in some senses, in terms of recognizing Aboriginal people's knowledges over the seas and waterways and rivers and estuaries, and how to think of the to think of these spaces and environmental spaces in the same way as we think of land and land rights and recognize Aboriginal people's knowledges as they are represented in art is where we have these. Um, we it's you know the job's never finished. I think that's actually one piece of advice. I could give to anyone who's working in the arts and sometimes when you get like really frustrated and you um, just don't see an end in sight I think you know the trick to that is to realizing that there is no end in sight and things are just constantly evolving and growing and you know we're overturning this monolith of colonialism which was built over the top of 300 or more aboriginal nations but the work that we do as curators and you know as arts workers is where we can actually um, change that narrative for the better. Um, so this is the Gapu Monarch saltwater bark painting collection, which is held by the Australian National Maritime Museum. And it is actually, as there's a big new project in relation to underwater archeology, span for example, but these are lands that have been submerged for thousands of years where they're finding different types of stone tool artifacts and things like that. Um, who are the community authorities and you know, how do we recognize Aboriginal people's rights to these objects and these knowledges which are made by their ancestors but don't fall under the modern borders that we have on our continental land map. Um, so not to mention some of the amazing um, First Nations to First Nations connections and histories that sort of ties back to my own personal story of the South Sea Islanders who were brought to Australia through North Queensland and through the Torres Strait in the late 1860s to 1900s. And how do we actually, and my goal for myself really is to um, overwrite those different sorts of borders and through the artistic engagement practices, which I've learned over the years, um, just build a space where thousands more people um, have the right to assert their own authority over their um, as their knowledges and their their rights to country and land and seas and skies. <laughs> I think that's it for me. Thanks, Matt. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Some technical issues, that's all right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Matt. I mean, what a what an extraordinary examples and and um examplars of different ways of working with um the diversity and the spectrum of our peoples. Um Tasha had very similar um like um diversity in the last presentation she did in the sense that it was a full spectrum of ideas and, and ways of working because it's not one way works you know and to see all of those different ways of working it is extraordinary Matt so thank you so much for sharing that and also thank you for sharing all of the history behind how we've arrived where we've arrived today that was really quite special um Everyone's stream, everyone's commenting. It's buzzing all over the place. You're a superstar, Matt. Um, I have two questions. And if anyone has any questions, um, please feel free. I'd much prefer to hear your questions than my questions. <laughs> but Matt, one question I have for you at the moment is, how do you think the glam sector um, 
galleries, literature, you know, uh, museums might look like for um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander arts workers and our culture in, say, the next five years? What might that um, look like? I think it's going to be more, it, well, it needs to be more connected. I think we've seen it recently in those discussions about, you know, where should the National Art Gallery, of uh, National Aboriginal Art Gallery go? Should it be Adelaide, Alice Springs, Darwin, Perth? Everyone's sort of putting their hat in the ring for this one national monolithic museum. Whereas we already have probably 200 art centres across the country and we need to find much better ways to resource all those museums and galleries so that people are just connected better. And, you know, that can be through loans, through places like the National Museum or the National Gallery or things like that. I think within five years time, with hopefully the one positive from the experience of all these online meetings that we've been doing the last couple of years, we've actually realised that, you know, distance isn't that important and we can, there's no excuse really for not talking to the people who need to be spoken to first about how to do that well. Um, because, yeah, it's not the same seeing an exhibition on a screen. I totally get that. I don't particularly enjoy it. You still need to physically be in a lot of these places, and that's the key to where we want to be in five years' time. Um, but it's, you know, it's about finding a better way to for people to transfer their skills that they learn in one part of the country to another part of the country or, you know, mm -hmm. to change from one aspect of the arts industry to another aspect of the arts industry. Some of the best curators I've met have been, you know, from the theatre world or, you know, from dance and different things like that. You know, there's a very interdisciplinary nature, which is a key to really great arts projects. And I think in five years time, we really need to, to understand that better instead of putting everyone in their little boxes and sort of, you know, specialising in one particular thing. The less mm. we specialise in, the better, I think. And the more we, the more we connect better, through not specialising. It's interesting you say sense. that. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, I was finished. It's interesting you say that, Matt, because, of course, when we reflect on the oldest living education system in the world, it's song, story and dance. And it is that multi-connected, that interconnected way of doing the arts. It's combined art. You know, um, very interesting. We, we have um, a whole bunch of wonderful people streaming in. We've got um, uh, uh, Kimberly um, Moulton streaming in. We've got Tasha James. We've got Barangal Wadri. How fabulous. We adore you all. Ray, lovely to see you here. Um, of course, Helen from West Farmers. Thank you so much. Uh, we have from Kimberly uh, Moulton down at the National Gallery of Victoria. Her question is, uh, thank you, Matt, and wonderful to hear you speak. I wanted to ask your thoughts on the ways to take the museum out to community. Physical, ob uh, physical objects, knowledge, um, keeping places, etc. Have you had projects that have done this successfully? Thanks for the question. Very good question. Wow. Um, that two-way street's really interesting because, yeah, you do need to have quite good facilities to take really old materials or fragile materials, for example. But that's not to say that you can't um, connect with contemporary artists to bring those sort of knowledges back into museums without sort of putting the horse before the cart. I mean, um, it's about just building better facilities and resourcing them better. Um, you know, there's no shortage of communities that would like to see some of these things that have been in museum storerooms for decades and probably have no plans to be exhibited, actually being exhibited, you know, safely and culturally safely in the places where they're supposed to be. Um, yeah, because, yeah, it's not the same when you take just a big folder of photos out. Um, but I think there's a role there for organisations like IATSIS in different sort of places in that world where they have the sort of missing parts of the information. You know, one of the most frustrating things working as a curator is, you know, one part of the object is in one institution, another part of it is in another. In between that, there's photographs of the event in a different space. Um, so I think especially the, the national focused institutions really need to develop a better framework of um, information sharing so that 
you know, if we wanted to look at all the Wiradjuri objects together and do consultations out on country at our fingertips, we could sort of show people that, you know, we're not hiding where this is as museum workers. It's just that it's distributed in so many different places, every, all these little parts of knowledge and parts of information that sort of need to be brought back together to give communities a clear idea of how to make those decisions. Um, but there's definitely chances to um, develop a national touring program. Um, you know, that's done respectfully. You don't just put one nation's objects on another nation's um, music exhibition space without a huge conversation taking um, place underneath that. Um, so it's these forums where we can actually talk and make those connections and reanimate the song lines, for example, and sort of show that there are deeper connections with communities, with nations that are thousands of miles apart, for example. Um, so yeah, that's a, it's a really great question. And it's, it shows you just again, how much more work we need to be doing. I mean, so many of us are focused just on the exhibitions and collections in our own institutions, let alone, you know, you don't often get that permission to go out and help out other institutions unless there's a, a demonstrable purpose for it. So I think we just have to get better at collectively, you know, using our voice through networks like West Farmers Indigenous Arts Leadership Program and actually putting um, plans together because if we wait for them to be given to us, it's gonna take forever. We really need to actually build our own little thing here and show people what it is so that we can connect the right resources to it because I think the resources are out there too. But it's that gap between what people want and what they need and you know how we can actually make that happen that is the really exciting space that we need to be working at and that is probably more touring exhibition stuff as Kimberly was saying so yeah I mean the more we can tour around Australia and around the world even um, the better it is in terms of the long-term store knowledges which become attached to these objects yeah, definitely. And Kimberly and Ray and Tasha, of course, are all Indigenous Arts Leadership Programs supported by West Farmers alumni. Um, so, you know, we continue we, to continue to platform those stories, I think, are really important because everyone has such wonderful ideas, um, which is exampled in, in what you've been doing and throughout your career, uh, Matt. And we're so thrilled that, we're, that, we're, that we have you there at the National Maritime Museum of Australia. You're going to do great things. So you should be right, rightly proud. And thank you so much for um, uh, being involved in uh, the leadership program this year and graduating. We're thrilled to have you as now an alumni of the program, um, continuing that legacy forward. And um, uh, wonderful to have you uh, streaming in from, uh, from, from direct country, I believe, yes? Uh, Wangal. Wangal, Wangal country. <laughs> so thank you so much, Matt. No and thank, thank you, you everyone for watching today. And um, we hope to see you all again very soon. Thanks.